Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now today, I'm honoured to be speaking with neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett. Lisa, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to have you on. I've been tweeting about it the last few weeks. Um, really excited to to get you on the show and to talk about your new book. I think to get us started, there's going to be so many listeners, Lisa, who who know of you, know of your work, uh, have read uh, your your books and watched your TED talks. But um, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the Sports Site Show audience, that would be awesome. Sure. Uh, My name is Lisa Feldman Barrett. I'm a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University, which is in Boston, Massachusetts in the USA. I um, also have research appointments at Harvard Medical School and uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, I run a pretty large lab. That's my main job. Um, uh, But I also uh, communicate science to the public. I'm just going to confess right now that I'm from Toronto. So my original, you know, my original love is hockey. Sorry, uh, Boston. Although I've lived in Boston for many years. And so, um, you know, I um, uh, and I drive by Fenway Park, you know, practically every day when I was actually driving uh, into work. And uh, hopefully that will resume again. Okay, so uh, so hockey is your sport? I wouldn't say that. I, I would say, you know, just to be come clean with your listeners, I am not really a terribly athletic person by nature. I, I, I would say it's really more nurture in the sense that, um, you know, I personally am not a very sporty person. I don't play sports. I do work out every day. I've had a personal coach for the last 15 years um, I do a lot of weightlifting and now yoga, uh, you know, intense yoga. Um, and uh, I just got myself a Peloton bike so I can race people. Um, but I'm not, my competitiveness is really in the domain of, I think, uh, scientific and intellectual things. I'm just not really gifted as an athlete. I've had to work really hard to um to develop any skill at all. But when you live in Toronto, just like living in Boston, you know, there's a certain, um, it's just part of the culture. You know, your brain is wired to attend to certain things and uh, hockey is a big deal, you know, in in Toronto and uh, just in the same way that um, baseball and to some extent football are big deals here. I suppose there's also other sports too, but really baseball and football are the ones that make the news most frequently in Boston, I would say. Well, being being an Englishman, I'm you know I have a, a reasonable knowledge of uh, American sports, uh, and I, I know that in Boston, I suppose the three main teams I believe are the Red Sox mm-hmm. in baseball, the Celtics in basketball, and the Patriots in, in American football. Right. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I said to you off air, hey, look, I've got this this idea, Lisa. Whether it's a great idea, I don't know, but um, what we'll do to unpack your new book that I'm so excited to talk to you about, we're we're we're, we're going to unpack each chapter uh, a little bit and then uh, imagine that uh, the Red Sox, the Celtics and or the Patriots have have brought both of us in, yourself as a neuroscientist, myself as a sports psychologist, to equate some of the things in the book with regard what might be relevant for them. So we'll have some fun trying to do that. And obviously, I've mentioned your book. You've got a new book out, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. And when I saw this book was out, having read your previous book, watched your TED Talk, knowing a little bit about your research, I was super excited to to read it. And that's where I've got in contact with you. And you've kindly agreed to come on and talk about it. Uh, how, how long has this book been in the making, Lisa? This book took about uh, 18 months, I would say, to write, and um, it took about 18 months to write it, and then, you know, it's usually about a year to get it in production and print it up and so so on. So unlike How Emotions Are Made, which was my first book, that took three and a half years to write, this book was considerably faster. (laughs) Well, you... 
you know, you unpack such a complex topic so well. And, I, you know, being a sports psychologist, I'm passionate about demystifying psychology for sports competitors and, and, and coaches and even sports parents. Uh, and so I appreciate the enormous challenge that you, you had far, far greater than I have in the world of sports psychology, trying to unpack neuroscience uh, for the public. And, uh, and you've done this in seven and a half lessons. Uh, and you actually start with the half lesson first and Lisa you don't start with a with with a nice little jab you actually give us a right hook straight away in in uh, this half lesson it, it's entitled the brain isn't for thinking and it's like whoa the brain isn't for thinking what is the brain for please tell us a little bit about what the brain is for if it's not for thinking I think what I'm going to say might sound really intuitive in a, in a way to your to your listeners in particular mm -hmm. Um, uh, once I say it, and, and that is the following that, you know, when one of the things about humans, you know, is that we, we sort of value the things that we're really, really good at. And one of the things we're really good at is thinking rationality, whatever that means, which we'll talk about, you know, in the next lesson. But this is something that we really value amongst ourselves, at least in the West. And it's so it's, it's natural for us to believe that this is really what our brains really evolved for, particularly in comparison to other brains. Um, the thing is that if you look at the evolutionary history of the brain, you take a little peek into uh, how brains evolved, what you realize is that brains did not evolve to think. They didn't evolve to feel. They didn't evolve to see. They didn't evolve to do the everyday things that our brains do very naturally and efficiently. Everything your brain does, thinking, feeling, seeing, it does to control your body in the most metabolically efficient way. So basically your brain, brains evolved to run the systems of your body in a really efficient way um, so that you can survive and thrive and do the most important thing um, from evolution's perspective, which is to pass your genes on to the next generation and support that uh, those offspring to the point where they reproduce as well. And basically, um, you know, taking this perspective allows us to really understand human performance a little differently. And it also allows us to understand the mysteries of mental and physical illness and wellness in a little bit of a different way than is um is typically the case so what you're essentially saying is our complex brain is for and you use this term body budgeting yeah i think you can the the technical term is allostasis which means to um the brain is predicting the needs of the body and attempting to meet those needs before they arise. So if your brain is going to stand you up, it's going to raise your blood pressure a little bit so that oxygen can reach your brain um, and so that you don't faint because that would be, you know, fainting is, is a metabolically costly thing. Or before a batter steps up to a plate, the plate, you know, to, to take a swing in baseball, you know, the, that batter's brain is going to adjust um, metabolically what's happening in the body. I mean, even in the morning, for example, right before you get out of bed in the morning, you have a surge of cortisol, which by the way, is not a stress hormone. It's a hormone that gets glucose into your bloodstream quickly because your brain is predicting that you're going to need it. You know, the two most expensive things your brain can do is move your body and learn. And so it, it, when you're doing something really expensive, uh, it's better to um, get the resources in place beforehand, predictively, and then try to correct if necessary. And the way that I've described this is, um, you know, that your brain is basically running a budget for your body. And it's not running, you know, it's not budgeting money, it's budgeting glucose, salt, water, oxygen, all the nutrients and chemicals and, and so on that your brain needs to control in order to keep your body alive. You're essentially talking about energy efficiency. And, and, and this is so, I mean, when related to sport, Lisa, this is just so important and, and almost, 
I would describe an invisible mediator of success is probably str- quite a strong word, but attainment, certainly. Um, let me give you a working example, for, probably from my own playbook, and see if this resonates with you. What I find, I mean, you mentioned the batter walking up to the plate. So we're talking baseball here. So we're now being employed by the Red Sox. And, and what I what I find is a lot of sports competitors who take their sports seriously, whether that's at the developing elite level or the adult elite level, um, they they think a lot about their sport because it's meaningful to them. But 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 those thought processes eat up sugars and glucose. I believe you might come back at me and say I'm, I'm incorrect there or inaccurate. But uh, and and what you find is they deplete their stores of of glucose and sugars, and so subsequently they're actually reports you get back as a sports psychologist is Dan, I was fatigued before I even started. And when you question them, they'd been thinking all night, all day, all morning for an afternoon kickoff or start. They've been thinking all day, all morning about it, and so subsequently their body budget was out of balance. I mean, that was just one of many, many sort of factors I could think where this was so relevant for human performance, especially in sport. Well, I think you're you're right, and I think it's important to realize that everything you do can be thought of in terms of deposits and withdrawals from your body budget because yeah. your brain is always always controlling your body even when you're asleep, and so. Metaphorically, you know, we can think about deposits into your body budget, like sleep and eating healthfully. And um, we can think about withdrawals, um, like, you know, moving or um, ruminating, which is what you were just describing. Um, Or, um, you know, uh, even you can think, I mean, even to some extent, exercise is a withdrawal, any kind of physical activity is a withdrawal, but it's kind of a, uh, an investment that you're making. So some, some, you know, withdrawals are squandering resources and other withdrawals are um, investments that you expect to get a return on. And so, for example, practicing, um, you know, practicing to develop muscle memory, as it's sometimes called, um, you can think about that's a, if you're developing uh, expertise at a sport, that's something that you really want to develop. If you're, when you're exercising, you know, during the day, like just in your everyday life, that's something you want to try to avoid that kind of efficiency. Um, uh, because, um, it makes your workouts really less intense. Um, that's why, you know, interval training is so useful as a, a workout tool because your brain, you're basically making it impossible for your brain to predict what you're going to have to do. And so you can't rely on muscle memory to do it. But when you're building skill in human performance, any kind of domain in human performance, ruminating is not helpful. Practice, however, is extremely helpful um, because it allows your brain to predict efficiently and um, effectively and predicting having your actions be executed mainly by predictions is much cheaper metabolically speaking than having to predict and correct, predict and correct, predict and correct, which, you know, in psychology, uh, we give that a fancy name. You know, we call it, we call it learning. (laughs) And, and, and you're kind of predicting what I want to come on and speak about, especially in lesson four, because it, it is just, scarily relevant to the work I do and other sports psychs and coaches do just dwelling just before we move on to the first lesson just dwelling briefly here you mentioned practice and uh, I would probably just like to get your comment on this because you talk about quite rightly how you know, practice is is uh, an important uh, withdrawal because you're trying to develop skill. However, I, I suppose over the last couple of decades, um, especially research coming out of um, skill acquisition departments in universities uh, and sports psychology departments, we've started to talk more about the importance of effective practice. We're very socialized in sport, Lisa, into the grind. You've got to grind. You've got to grind. You've got to grind. You've got to work really hard. And actually what we're trying to do now as sports sites is help people have a more sophisticated relationship with learning with practice and that the quality of practice trumps and triumphs over um the 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 quantity and i felt that aligned very nicely with this in terms of yes we do want to withdraw we don't want to withdraw so much the grind that we exhaust our, our our energy essentially Absolutely. And I think you're, what you're doing is you're taking a much more granular approach um, to understanding 
you know, what aspects of practice are useful and what aspects are not. So, you know, in the moment, right, in the moment of great physical exertion, as you're, um, you're basically reaching the threshold of your ventilatory load. So you're, you know, you're expelling as much carbon dioxide as you can, given the amount of oxygen that you're taking in, and you're starting to deplete your available glucose resources, you're, as that's happening, you're slowly, you know, increasing or, or sort of mounting up a temporary deficit, you could say, in your body budget. And so you're going to, you're going to feel pretty crappy at times. And in the moment, in an individual um, moment of practice, you have to push through that sometimes um, in order to get the maximum effect. However, after that's over, you really have to replenish. You have to rest and replenish and make those deposits um, so you can keep that body budget balanced. Um, so when we talk about keeping a balanced body budget, we're not saying that um, the, the evidence doesn't suggest that you should not expend energy. The evidence suggests that you should expend, you should spend and deposit to spend and replenish, spend and replenish, spend and replenish. And so you don't want to have that grind over days and days and days, because really what you're doing is you're driving your body budget into a deficit position, which not only makes you feel crappy, but eventually, if it goes on for too long, will actually make you sick. It's so fascinating, Lisa, because everything you're saying aligns lovely with uh, high performance sports. And, and just briefly before we move on to lesson one, um, I had Steve Magnus on on the show, and Steve is a, a leading athletics trainer in the US and and a sports scientist. And in his books that he's written about, he talks about um, uh, learning happens where stress and rest meet exactly what you're saying and we also talk in high performance environments about trying to create an environment of high challenge and high support which is what we're talking about here essentially is high challenge for yourself and high support for yourself so in in this half half uh, lesson it aligns brilliantly with what we know about excellence in a, in a sporting environment yeah we'll talk about the importance of um, here we're talking about high challenge and and um, we're talking about the sort of the physical um, manifestations of deposits. But when we talk about, um, you know, chapter, when we talk about essay five, we'll talk about support and, and, and what that means um, and how we are, you know, essentially the caretakers of each other's body budgets and other people have a really important role to play in the maintenance of our own body budgets. Well, let's let, let's move on to the essay one or lesson one. And and if you gave us a bit of a right hook at the beginning, I almost feel like this is a bit of an uppercut here, especially for myself as a sports psychologist who's rambled on about the importance of the frontal lobe. Um, I feel like I should be returning some money to clients, actually. Um, so uh, essay one is you have one brain, not three. Lisa, you've killed me here. Talk to me. <laughs> Tell me about this. Yeah. So, you know, there's <laughs> this very popular story about how the brain evolved and how the brain is structured, which goes something like this. You have um, uh, an inner lizard brain that houses your instincts, which is wrapped in a so-called limbic system where limbic means border. That is the regions of the brain that border the um, lizard brain, um, which is supposedly for emotion, and that both of these are your inner beast, your inner beast brain, essentially, that are controlled by your rational neocortex. And the assumption, this idea actually comes directly from Plato in ancient Greece, um, who was talking about the psyche, which loosely translated, very, very, very loosely translated would be the human mind. Um, and then in the mid 20th century, based on, you know, observing animal brains with the naked eye, neuroscientists basically tattooed this right onto the brain as a way of understanding brain evolution and brain function. So the idea is that your brain is a battleground between rational thought and um, emotions and instincts. And that when, um, you know, 
rational thought wins, you're healthy and moral person. And when emotions and instinct win, um, that means that you are, um, you know, either not, you know, that you're not, that you're not very mature or, or that you might be mentally ill, um, except under certain circumstances where um, emotions are considered to be okay. And the interesting thing about this from a neuroscience perspective is that it's completely a myth. It's just a complete myth. There's not a single grain of truth in it. Um, and this is really not how the brain evolved. And it's really not how the brain functions. You don't have parts of your brain for emotion. You don't have parts of your brain for rational thought. Your brain is not a battleground. And rationality is not the absence of emotion or feeling. That's just, just biologically impossible given how your brain is wired. Um, you, you're never in a moment in your entire life without feeling. Feeling and emotion are not necessarily the same thing as I describe in, in how emotions are made. Um, but basically your brain is always controlling your body by body budgeting and your body is always sending back sensations to your brain sense data about what's going on inside your body to your brain and those sense data you experience as simple feelings of feeling worked up or feeling calm feeling comfortable feeling uncomfortable feeling pleasant feeling unpleasant these feelings are properties of consciousness so they're always with you sometimes they're in the background of your experience, sometimes they're in the foreground, sometimes you conjure them into emotions, sometimes you don't, you sometimes embed them in perceptions of other people, like that's a really nice guy, this is a really delicious drink, that's a really beautiful painting. Um, you know, these fundamentally are feelings that are like a barometer of, of what's going on inside your body budget. And so you're linking rationality to um towards the or, or, or you're suggesting in this um essay that uh that people should uh direct their rationality towards their body budgeting that might be a fairly pragmatic thing to do in terms of getting on day to day absolutely absolutely i think that um that just in the same way that you adjust your spending for um, in your real bank account for, for, you know, the amount of money that you have. And if you have a really big expenditure coming up or a really big investment that you want to make, you have to, um, make, you know, you have to save up and, um, make a bunch of, you know, preparatory deposits, or when you're investing money, you know, in the stock market, you invest over the long term, right? You're not looking for quick payoffs. You're usually investing and expecting to, um, keep investing over the long term. You know, these kinds of metaphors actually work really well when thinking about what it means to be rational with the kind of brains and bodies that we have as humans. So again, I, I'm just, as you're speaking here, it's making my, me reflect on my work. And I, and I think this is where the half lesson and lesson one link in nicely with sport together is, again, I come back to this notion of, you know, if we've got our baseball players at the Red Sox or we've got our basketball players at the Celtics or the, the American football players at the Patriots, I, I think, uh, go with me with my, with my bit of fun here, but I, I think our work there would, would very much, to begin with, there would revolve around helping them with their body budgeting because if their body budgeting is great on a day-to-day -day basis if they're being rational towards their body budgeting they give themselves a better chance um, to uh, be ready to compete with energy come game day essentially absolutely that's absolutely right and um, I think that a lot of uh, I think a lot of sports, a lot of people on sports teams, you know, really understand this. I think Tom Brady understands this really well, mm -hmm. at least from what you can read in the newspapers. I think he's really, really careful about his body budget in terms of what he eats and how he how much he sleeps and um, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, there's a there's a I think to some extent athletes are many athletes are are ahead of the curve really when it comes to body budgeting not not everyone you know because you also hear or read stories about you know bad boys and and so on who um smoke and drink and and do all kinds of things and then you know for some period of time go out on onto the uh, arena floor and do, and do amazing things 
But largely speaking, that's not a really good plan for, for the long term, I would say. And, and so I think, I think people who play sports actually are ahead of the curve here who know that, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, what's the most important thing that I can do, um, you know, uh, for my body budget? Or what's the most important thing that I could do to um, regulate my emotions? Or, you know, what's the most important thing I can do to improve my life? And my answer is really boring. It's get enough sleep. Like if I could just pick one thing that, uh, you know, there are many things that you can do, but if you were only allowed one, it would be get enough sleep because so much happens when you are sleeping that is important for your body budget. All of the things that you have, and you know this, Dan, right? All the things that you, all the new information that you've exposed yourself to, which we in neuroscience would call prediction error. That is the stuff that you couldn't predict that you needed to learn. The actual consolidation of that learning happens largely when you're sleeping. Um, so it's sleeping is a restorative time that um, is is really important to like the efficient management of a of a body budget. Yeah, and and I'd also I'd, I'd say before we move on to essay two, Lisa, don't underestimate the importance of your first two essays here for sports because whilst you're right, yes, sport naturally is ahead of the curve, I suppose, because it demands that you get sleep and you eat well, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. When you're looking for those extra percentages, those small inches, etc., if if you can help coaches to help players see uh, this n- notion of body budgeting, uh, you, you're just giving it a neural underpinning, which I which I think is really, really important. And I think it's it's not how we necessarily see it, but but if we do, we can get better at it. I, I agree. I will say though, Dan, that I think I mean, you know, I you're you're the sports expert, but um, so you you would know better. But I would say that that the really surprising, you know, telling people eat healthfully, get enough exercise, you know, give your body sufficient rest, make sure that you stretch, and you know, uh, get in a massage now and then, and uh, you know. Um, make sure that you get enough sleep. Like these things are, it's surprising actually how important they are from a neuroscience standpoint, right? Like the neuroscience underscores how important they are, but they're not, I I would say most people don't find them super surprising. I think what people do find surprising is the extent to which other humans um, make uh, figuratively speaking deposits and withdrawals in our body budgets. That's, that's, I think the thing where the people that people find really really surprising yeah. which are some of the later the later essays in the book moving on to the next essay uh, your your brain is a, is a network um you have a wonderful i mean obviously what what we've said from essay one is that it doesn't the, the tree and brain doesn't exist um it doesn't work hierarchically from a reptilian to a limbic to a neocortex so it's a case of well how does our brain work what does it look like and you talk about a network as being well not a metaphor the most accurate way of describing our brain and but you do use a metaphor of an air traffic system which i just think is brilliant it helps me to really picture um uh, the, the brain and it gives me a feeling of the brain's dynamic behavior you talk about the brain's dynamic behavior that that um really our behavior is based on this network the 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 connections in our brain essentially that the wiring up of the brain yeah i think for many years scientists believed that you know there are a lot there are a lot of metaphors i guess that have been, been used to describe how brains work and for many years scientists believed that um, you know, one part of your brain was for thinking, another part of your brain was for feeling, another part of your brain was for attention, another part of your brain was for moving your body, and so on and so forth, kind of like Lego pieces that fit together, or puzzle pieces that fit together to make a puzzle. But what we've learned, yeah. really, is that's not at all how the brain works. And um, really, that the brain is, you know, give or take, you know, made of 128 billion little cells called neurons, which are bathed in a chemical system, bathed in chemicals. And these chemicals, along with other helper cells called glial cells, basically change the ease with which neurons speak to one another, pass information back and forth to one another. And what this means is that your brain is a single 
giant network of neurons that can take on literally trillions of different patterns. And so your brain is not really a collection of mental organs or Lego pieces or, or puzzle pieces, each one with a different function. Instead, your brain is a complex system, um, which means that these um, neurons, when they're passing information back and forth, um, can take on um, you know many, many, many different patterns. And so your brain can create, the same set of neurons can create many, many, many different actions and thoughts and feelings and so on. And so when we talk about complexity, what we really mean is that the system is producing outputs that are more than the sum of its parts, that they're working together um, to create something that no subset of them could create by themselves. So I've got a bit of a question here about this essay. So um, the brain's dynamic behavior, you talk about slow changes by plasticity. So that's essentially learning. Somebody practices a skill and their brain is changing and that's called plasticity. And you describe that in the essay. Faster changes by neurotransmitters and neuromodulation. Um, so one of the things I think that's, that perhaps coaches find difficult to understand, um, especially in quick team sports like basketball or ice hockey or soccer. It's they're very quick sports, they're very instinctive sports. Um, but I know from experience and I know from all my clients who speak to me every day at how they can make a mistake on the basketball court, for instance, like they'll pass the ball and they'll give it away. And suddenly they have their their experience of what's going on changes. Um, their mood changes, their emotion can change as well, their thoughts change. And and I think sometimes coaches struggle to understand how quick the brain can work. And is that, and, and I might be getting this wrong, Lisa, but is that because it's not about plasticity, it's the neurotransmitters that are changing to change your experience of your feelings, your body in that moment? Exactly. So I think the way, that's exactly right. So I think the way to think about it is, um, that um, that these these neurotransmitters and neuromodulators they're basically chemicals. Um, they can they really change the ease with which neurons can pass information back and forth to one another. And so your brain is constantly reconfiguring itself. It's um, that is out of a single physical structure you can get trillions of patterns. And so those patterns on average can change every hundred milliseconds or so. Whereas a motor movement, even just to pick up a pencil or something, you know, takes um, at least four to 500 milliseconds, maybe even longer for a really coordinated action um, like you would perform in sports. So you're talking about four or five potentially different shifts in the pattern in, within your brain that can occur within the time span of any single physical movement. Wow. So what I'm understanding there is your feeling, your affect, your, it, maybe your emotion as well, works, will work quicker than your action. Yes, exactly. In fact, this is why in essay four, I talk, lesson four, I talk about how the brain is predictive, not reactive. And meaning it's not like your brain is sitting around waiting to be stimulated by something in the world and then your brain prepares a motor movement and then you and then you act it preparing a motor movement takes relatively speaking a longer time than shifts in attention or shifts in thinking or shifts in feeling so actually moving your actually preparing the plan to move your muscles starts to occur you know relatively speaking well before the actions actually take place and this is a really it's really unintuitive <laughs> but it's but it's um you know honestly if, if i wasn't a neuroscientist and i didn't really understand what was happening under the hood i would i would have a hard time believing it because it it sounds like magic really but this is backed up by a tremendous amount of evidence. Um, and that is that 
you know, before you move your muscles to execute an action, your brain has spent at least probably, you know, a couple of hundred milliseconds, maybe even as long as a second, um, planning that action before, before it executes. So you, the way to think about your brain is that it's constantly talking to itself. It's constantly reconfiguring itself into different patterns. And, and many of those patterns, all of those patterns involve your motor cortex. Many of those patterns um, result in an actual physical action. Not all of them, but, but many of them do. Would I be right in saying that that constant reconnecting, reprocessing, reconfiguring is ambient neural activity? I've heard that term. Yeah, we call it, it's called intrinsic activity often. Um, but basically, um, you know, your brain is always talking to your body. Your body's always sending, sends data back to your brain. So right there, you've got a lot of activity which is occurring, um, even when you're sleeping, even when you're at rest. Um, you know, that's what daydreaming is. That's what imagining is. That's what, you know, to some extent, what memory is. Um, when you're, when you let your thoughts run wild, that's really what's happening is that your brain is, so we call intrinsic activity or spon sometimes people call it spontaneous activity. It's not really spontaneous though. What's happening is that, 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 that your brain is in a particular pattern it's, it's representing what it believes to be going on in the world and in your body at a given point in time. And then based on a lot of past learning, it makes predictions about what's going to happen next. And those predictions are essentially a change in the pattern that it's forming. And, and the other thing is that your brain isn't, it's not deterministic in the sense that your brain goes from one pattern to another pattern to another pattern. Really what's happening is that every time your brain is creating a selection of patterns um, that, that one of which will be chosen. So it's not, it's, it's sort of providing itself with options. Um, so your brain isn't necessarily making one motor plan at a given time. It might be making a couple. And it's going to, um, so that it has something to, to, to choose from once it has a little bit more information about which one is the, might, might be the right one. So it's, it, they're basically like guesses in a sense. That's really fascinating. And I, and I, I want to get on to that action, that mode plan in a second, because SA4 is so important for this. But I, I, I want to. I want to ask you something here. Given everything that you've said about the speed in which your neurotransmitters are working, so subsequently the experience of living in your body changes from moment to moment. I suppose a thesis I have as a sports psychologist, something when I sit down with a, with a client, and, and you can almost imagine, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you bought a Peloton bike and you're going to compete against people on that, on that bike. Um, my thesis is that when you're going into a competitive situation, that you are especially a complex one where the environment is always changing. So you've got a lot of cognitive demands placed on you. Your environment is constantly changing. That as a human being, you are best served putting mental objectives, so psychological objectives first because your brain works so quickly and will constantly change your experience. I make a mistake, I start to feel flat. The opposition's playing really well, I start to feel lethargic, I get frustrated, I experience all of these um, affect and emotional challenges. So I feel that I can be effective as a sports psychologist by helping uh, an athlete, a basketball player, say, have a, a plan, a mental plan going into their game because that helps them cope with the speed of the brain, how it's constantly shifting from a, a feeling perspective. Absolutely. Because essentially what you're doing, Dan, is you're helping your client to predict how they, you know, how they can nudge their brain in one direction or another, um, uh, you know, in those moments. So, and, and what's really interesting is that this is, I think, something that that all of us do 
when we're coaching people, you know, so I don't coach athletes, I coach scientists in a sense, right? I coach young scientists and, you know, our games are five or six years long, (laughs) you know, and, but so, but what happens when, you know, other people are criticizing you or when you have an experiment that fails or, you know, lots of different, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very similar in the sense that you have to have a game plan. You have to have a plan for if your brain can go in a lot of different directions um, in the given moment, you know, part of what your attentional system is for in your brain is to kind of nudge your brain, nudge those patterns along one trajectory rather than another. And so if you can be planful about it, really what you're doing is you're saying, you're sort of making a plan about what you're going to pay attention to, what you're, how you're going to shift your attention, um, which is in effect constructing your environment for yourself. Mm. So right now, there's a lot of sense, sensory information available to you, and your brain is only foregrounding some of it. So, for example, if you're sitting down. You, there is sense data available to your brain that your brain's probably not paying attention to, like the pressure of the seat of the chair against your thighs or the pressure of the floor against your feet or the sound of a heater maybe or an air conditioner or maybe a, you know, a slight noise outside. The point is that you know, that information is there. It's just your brain doesn't foreground everything. But you can change, you can shift your attention. And in doing that, really what you're doing is you're saying, these are the parts of the environment that I really care about right now. And I don't really care about these other ones. That in effect will shift these patterns. It will shift the trajectory of these patterns. And that's really what you're doing when you are avoiding that feeling of exhaustion or that feeling of weariness or, and you're instead focusing on something else, you're basically shifting the, you know, the word that scientists would use is niche, but you're shifting the parts of the environment that, that matter to your goal. And um, in doing so, really what you're doing is you're shifting the trajectory of your brain's predictions and therefore your actions, the predicted actions that will come from those. So, so, so based on that, what you're talking about here is so important for motor development in sport. So what you've just said there relates to say let's come back to say basketball so uh, as a coach I want to expose basketball players to as many experiences as possible on the court and help direct their attention to their environment to help them build chunks of memory so that they can predict what's going to happen next um I would say that the best basketball players in the world are the ones who could predict most accurately uh, and quickly. Um, They work quicker than others. Um, Would that be, it's about building chunks of memory during practice in order to improve that prediction, that anticipation, essentially. Absolutely. That's exactly right. The only thing I would add is that Mm. when we talk about prediction, we aren't necessarily meaning consciously. Like it's not necessarily the case that a great player can necessarily verbalize, is, is aware of the predictions and can verbalize them because your brain is predicting pretty automatically. Um, and so really great coaches, maybe great players. I mean, there are some people who probably with a lot of very attentive observation can, um, distill down those predictions into verbal instructions. But at first, when your brain is, is um, learning and predicting, it's the whole thing's happening pr- pretty automatically. And the only other thing I'll say is that this is why it's also really important, not just to practice the skill in one circumstance, but to practice it in lots of different circumstances, particularly circumstances where an error has occurred, or you might um, have to get yourself out of a pro- out of a problem situation. So the analogy for me would be growing up in Canada. You know, I-, I had to learn to drive on the ice, and so every year in Boston, the first big snow, I get into my car and I deliberately put myself into a tailspin. And the reason why is I'm reminding my brain how to predict my actions 
what to do when I, when I start to feel when I, you know, when my brain is, is, is anticipating a tailspin is going to happen. And I, I might even, my brain even might to start to detect, you know, subtle movements that even before I'm conscious of them, it, it can use that information to get me out of that, to engage in a motor, execute a motor, a set of motor actions that will get me out of that tailspin. And, um, I'm not even sure that I could tell you exactly how I can do it, but I can do it. And I practice it every year, the first snowfall of the year. And so it's really, I'm sure this is something that coaches know, but it's really important when you're practicing a skill to practice it in as many variations as possible, um, because that really does seed your brain to predict in a much more um, robust and effective way. Fascinating because it, 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 I suppose there's two directions one could take that. It, it's either called repetition without repetition. So rather than this notion of repeat, 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 it's repetition without repetition, which is basically variability, adding mm-hmm. variability in your practice, interleaving variability. There, there's the, the research evidence from a guy called Robert Bjork, um, who he's, he's based out in California, and um, he is an expert on learning and memory. And he talks about adding in desirable difficulties to practice in order to learn. Um, repetition, um, uh, excuse me, uh, variability, interleaving, um, those kind of uh, ideas help people to learn, essentially. I, I, I had uh, one quick question before we move on to the next lesson, and that's you, you mentioned that the predictive brain isn't necessarily saying that uh, athletes are conscious of what's going on. Um, and this is an interesting juxtaposition in in sport but I'd like to get your opinion here I'll I'll use a basketball example so we've got our basketball players on the court and they've learned all these chunks they've got lots of chunks of memory with relation to the game so that so they have a real expertise they've got a problem solve as well the game is always changing the environment is changing in many respects team invasion sports like soccer like basketball are about the relationship between players um, space and the ball say so the the landscape is constantly shifting so that there has surely there has to be an element here of the expertise in a game like that is that they are both there's memory and there's a form of online assessment going on at every single second yes well i think the 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 way that i would describe it is that memory is online assessment at every single second so memory is largely misconstrued by the public, I think. Memory, memories aren't retrieved. They're not stored in your brain and retrieved like files. Memories are assembled or reconstructed or re-implemented in the wiring of your brain. And your brain has this real amazing capacity to take bits and pieces of past experience and configure them in new ways. That's what it means to remember. So every time you have a conscious memory of something, your brain has actually changed the firing of its own neurons to resemble what the pattern was the last time you had that experience. It's not exactly the same. And in fact, you know, what this ability that we have to com- bits, combine bits and pieces of, of new experience is called generativity. It means that your brain is information gaining, meaning it's creating new information. It's creating new knowledge for you by, um, by combining bits and pieces of past experience. And, you know, when I am giving talks to people, I use this GIF. It's this really amazing GIF where it's, um, it's a little movie of um, electrical towers playing jump rope. And it's a visual image, a visual movie with no sound. What's really, really interesting about it, though, is that everyone, everyone who sees it knows what it is. But how could they know what it is? Because no one's ever in their entire lives ever seen electrical towers playing jump rope. How would you know what it is? And the answer is because your brain is combining bits and pieces of past experience. Um, in order to allow you to see um, the and understand what you're seeing. So it's done this problem solving thing kind of in the blink of an eye. 
And the other really interesting thing is that not only do you see these towers jumping rope, you can hear the thud of those towers hitting the ground and you can feel it in your chest as if the ground were shaking. This is all just from watching a film. So how could that be? And the answer is because your brain, when your brain makes a prediction, it's literally changing the firing of its own neurons. So you are prepared to see things that might not be there. You're prepared to hear things that might not be there. You're prepared to feel things that might not be there. And then the brain waits for information from the world and from the body to confirm or to change the prediction. And when the prediction changes, that's called learning. So my point to you is that memory actually is a kind of expertise in a way. The way that memory works endows you with this expertise to do problem solving on the spot um, into um, be able to create a new pattern that it's never, ever created before, just out of bits and pieces of past. Fascinating. Fascinating. Right. Okay. A lot to get my head around there. That's brilliant. I've, um, I'm conscious of your time and there's two things two more things I'm desperate to talk to you about. So we'll, we'll, we'll dart through them as quickly as, as we can. Um, and that's from lesson number five. Um, your brain works secretly with other brains. And hey, we could do half a morning talk about it, talking about this when it comes to coaching. But the power of words and specifically the notion that let's go back to body budgeting. Words influence body budgeting. This is, has enormous repercussions for coaching, you know, using appropriate words in order to influence um, your athlete's internal sensations, what they're experiencing. I think that's so important for coaches. Absolutely. I, I think, um, I guess there are a couple of things to say about this. One is that, you know, we are social animals and that means that we regulate each other's nervous systems. We, we make, figuratively speaking, deposits and withdrawals into each other's body budgets. And so, for example, when you were saying, you know, about team invasion sports, the landscape is always shifting because, you know, other people are involved, your teammates and so on. That's, um, you know, other, what your other teammates do, your ability to predict what they do where you they are predictable to you and you are predictable to them the extent to which all of that w works in a predictable way um to you it, it actually lightens the load on your on your body budget it it makes um it makes the 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 play you know more efficient less of a metabolic drain yep. Um, yep. When you talked about, you know, coaching as high challenge and, and as well as high support, again, you know, having a coach, there's research to show that you're, you know, you're actually more metabolically efficient just walking up a hill um, when you're with a friend or somebody that you trust. And um, so what's interesting, as you point out, is that part of that equation, part of some of that equation is about um, the body's human body's via human brains actually coordinate themselves with one another in, in really miraculous and unexpected ways, I would say. But, but, but part of it is also that all animal species that are social animals find ways of regulating each other's body budgets. You can do it by sight. You can do it by sound. You can do it by touch. You can do it by smell. Humans can do it by all of those means plus with words. Right. So I could text three little words to a very close friend halfway around the world and I can change her breathing. I can change her metabolism. I can change her heart rate without her even seeing my face or, or hearing my voice. Um, you can read something in a book. You know, this is why people find the Quran or the Bible um, or any, you know, or poetry from the past. So any text from the past can reach forward you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of years uh, in, into the future and you read them and you, you take comfort or solace from, or you feel inspired by those words. Well, all of those feelings have an under, under the hood, there, there are physical changes happening because you read those words. So when we speak words to each other, they directly affect each other's nerve. We directly affect each other's nervous systems through the words that we speak, not because, um, we, you know, for better or for worse, actually, not because we are weak 
or because we're snowflakes, but because we're human and we have human nervous systems. And I think in, in, in high performance domains, people realize this because we, we have ways of encouraging each other with words um, to persevere. Um, and that always has body budgeting um, consequences. So, and if you look at the neuroscience, if you look at the way that the brain is wired, you can see why this is the case because the regions of the brain that are important for processing language are also important for regulating your nervous system. It's fascinating. You call it the language network and, and um, it, it, you know, that, that network can also adjust your glucose entering your bloodstream to fuel your cells. And what I'd throw at you there is adjectives. In the world of sport, adjectives and metaphors are massive, especially in my work. If you think about walking on the stage for a TED Talk or you think about going on your Peloton bike or for the basketball players going onto the court, if we think of words like dominant, alert, alive, lively, relentless, sharp, um, anything like that, and add that to your objectives. Well, I want to deliver this TED Talk, um, dominant and upbeat. I want to uh, execute these plays on the basketball court, sharp and focused. Um, those adjectives are, are, when a player thinks about that, pictures them and goes out there and strives to make that their main objective. Yeah, you know, you know Dan, I, when I get, very before I gave my TED Talk, I could feel my um, heartbeat pulsing in my fingertips. Like I was hugely, hugely, had huge uh, sympathetic arousal and parasympathetic withdrawal. I was really, really ramped up. And in that moment, I remembered these words that my daughter, when my, my daughter was 12 years old, she um, got her black belt in karate from a 10th degree black belt who said to her, get your butterflies flying in formation. And really, so what he was telling her is, use that arousal to be determined and not afraid. This is a lesson that, um, you know, I explain the, the neuroscience of this lesson in, in more so in how emotions are made. But the, the point is that the word determination has a very different set of meanings and also actions than the word anxiety. Yet the level of physical arousal in the body and brain is the same. So you have the capacity by the, the means, by means of concepts and words that you use to transform physical states into a set of actions. And those actions will be very different depending on the words and concepts that are used. From exactly the same physical state of physical arousal, you can conjure determination or anxiety. Fascinating. Leads me on to my final question uh, or, or a point I, I want to raise here. And it comes back, you mentioned it earlier, affect, um, which isn't necessarily a particular uh, a word that that the public know very well. We know emotion. We don't necessarily necessarily know affect. And if we're talking sport here, I, if there's a silent mediator of success, there's another silent mediator here. It's affect, because um, you've got a wonderful uh, little uh, diagram in in uh, lesson six, um, and you, you're talking about mood essentially, which is is affect. And you talk about mood being feelings that are pleasant to unpleasant, idle to activate. And this is huge in sport. The number of sports competitors who come to me and say, Dan, I just wasn't feeling it today. Oh, it wasn't happening for me. Oh, I felt flat and lethargic. And there is it, nobody ever talks about it openly and publicly. There's not much written about it in sport. It blows my mind. And yet this is a huge mediator for performance. Um, so uh, there's not a question, Lisa. It's almost like a thank you for putting this in your book, because I can assure any coach reading this needs to pay attention to it. Yeah, thank, I'm so pleased that you um, that you found this useful because I do think that this is once you understand that your brain is constantly running a budget for your body, and you understand that the the simple feelings that come from that body budgeting, which are affect or mood, and that those are with you at every waking moment of your life, um, and that that your brain they're really um, like a 
like a barometer of how your body budget is doing and they're not emotion right that you can you can conjure them into emotion mm -hmm. but you can also use them i mean look evolution did not fashion us with a you know like a smart watch that you know beeps you when you need more glucose or beeps you you know when you're dehydrated or you know it would be nice if we had that kind of precision like you know oh your glucose level is low you know eat a banana or something but that's not what we have what we have is this kind of really fuzzy sort of very general i feel worked up i feel calm i feel comfortable i feel uncomfortable and then we have to kind of figure out what the hell does that mean <laughs> and what am i supposed to do about it and that's really where um the the real expertise comes in, in, in trying to, in, in sort of equipping yourself with enough experiences and enough learning and enough vocabulary, frankly, um, to, um, have a, you know, a range of flexibility in, in, um, tailoring your actions, how you, the meaning that you make out of affective feelings or mood, um, to the situation that you're in or to the goals that you want to achieve. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and, and my, my last thing to say, Lisa, is I, I just can't, uh, you know, I'm almost talking to the audience here, which is I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of, of reading this book, because if you can help your players predict better, if you can help them manage um, their, their body budget, um, if you can help them manage their mood, if you can help them... Um, you know, work better together or play better together and we didn't really it really hit on that at all um in any detail there's every single chapter um there's there's little um golden nuggets uh, for coaches for players and for sports parents as well so lisa thank you so much for writing the book and thank you so much for coming on uh, and maybe you'll come on again in the future and we'll do an even deeper dive that would be delightful. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Psych Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.